here. Um, thanks for jumping on for this uh, webinar called um, Fam Your Family and Technology. And with us today, we have uh, Bobby Cooley. Bobby is the uh, adult discipleship pastor at Kingland's ba Kingsland Baptist Church uh, in Katy, right outside of Houston. And um, I've known Bobby for quite a while. Um, first made connections with him and when we were both in student ministry world. Uh, and um, so we have a lot of mutual friends in student ministry. And so I'm excited about him being here with us today. Um, if you have any questions, you notice in the, in the chat there that uh, Chris is with us here today too. He's kind of behind the scenes running the show, but if you have any questions um, that we're going to have, Bobby's going to do his presentation. And then at the end, we're going to leave plenty of time for question and answer. So if you have any of those, just submit those uh, through the Q and a button or, uh, and, and we'll get to those as many of those as we can. So uh, let me pray for us. And then I'm going to turn it over to Bobby. Father, I thank you for today. And I thank you for the opportunity to gather together with these parents um, to talk about an important subject, Father, to talk about technology in our homes. And uh, Father, we thank you for the gift of technology and, and so much that we can do with it. The fact that we're doing this right now, Father, is because of technology. And, and we know it's, it's important, Father, but we also know that uh, just like anything else in our lives, Father, we have to put guardrails around it and we have to be mindful, God, to not let it run us, but, uh, but Father, that we use it as a tool uh, for good in our families. And so, God, I just pray in this time that you would you would uh, speak to us through Bobby. Thank you for Bobby and his ministry. Thank you for Kingsland Baptist Church and all the great things that they're doing in the Katy area and, and all over the world, God, and, and particularly in, in the area of families. And so, God, I just pray for him and thank you for him and his family. And uh, we look forward to our time together. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. All right, Bobby, okay. turn it over to you, bro. All right. All right. Thank you, sir. I'm going to screen share. Um, I got some slides and stuff as we go through this, but uh, I just want to say all the parents, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being a part of this. Um, you know, one of the things that we say at Kingsland all the time is parents are the A team and the church is the B team. And uh, it's because you have the time, the energy and the equity with your kids and only you can do certain things uh, that the church can't. However, as the church, and I know Jimmy's heart, want to come alongside and lock arms with you and partner with you as you do raise your kids. And so um, today, as we talk about technology and we talk about uh, these things specifically, um, I just want you to know <laughs> that I'm not a technology expert. Um, I've grown up in technology. I've grown up with technology. Um, but the stuff that I want to challenge us, us with us today is, is more in line with parenting in general surrounded uh, by what we're using right now, and that is technology. And uh, it's a good tool, but it can also be used for evil. Um, is my slides up, Jimmy? Thumbs up. Um, this is me, my family. Uh, I it, <laughs> married to my amazing wife for 14 years. We have three kids. Charlie in the middle, he's eight. He's a third grader. Chapman's on my wife's lap. He turns four next week. He is our wild child. And then my daughter Chandler May um, thinks she's perfect and she kind of is, but uh, she's on my lap. And it's our, our house is not perfect. Our house is uh, not quiet, but we try to make a peaceful home as much as possible. And so just so you know, personally where we're at, um, we are in the middle of switches and iPads and my son's already asking for a phone because some of his friends in school already have phones in third grade, which is another subject that we'll get to here in a second. Um, but uh, also, as Jimmy said, I worked with teenagers for over 15 years. And so I've worked with teenagers. I've had the conversations with parents of, hey, my kid just we just caught him looking at porn. Like I've gone through that with, with families. And um, as we get started, I just want to throw it out uh, for a question that you could put in the chat is what is your biggest fear when it comes to technology as a parent? Uh, many of you might be saying it is porn, but what is your biggest fear or biggest worry or biggest concern when it comes to technology? Go ahead and write that in the chat. But a little background about me. I uh, spent a lot of time in student ministry, did that for a long time. I, I still love student ministry, still involved in, in several aspects of that world. Um, but in 2011, Kara Powell wrote a book called Sticky Faith. And this book is a research, research study 
where she studied um, oh, hundreds of students post-graduation and then four years later through college. And what she found is 45 to 50 percent of those kids walked away from their faith. And instead of focusing on those kids who left, she spent all the research on the kids whose faith stuck. And it's why it's called sticky faith. And the number one correlation, correlation of sticky faith is that parents modeled faith at home. And so in 2013, uh, I read this book. I was a little late to the game reading this book, but I read this book and I was just enamored by it. And I, I said, okay, 45 to 50% of kids. And I was in full on the, in the trenches of student ministry at this time. And uh, we had what we call a legacy wall. And on the legacy wall is all of our senior classes uh, for years and years and years. And I went to our youth building and, and walked around and, and looked at the legacy wall of all these classes. I said, I'm the greatest youth pastor that's walked the earth. Like my kids are not going to walk away from their faith because I did everything I could to make sure we had camps and mission trips and Bible studies. I'm awesome and not my kids. So I remember going by myself into our youth room 2013, looking at these uh, pictures. And as I looked at these pictures, my heart sunk and just began to realize that the study and my group was about the same. Um, we, we were seeing 40 to 50% of the kids, kids that I knew, kids that I loved, kids that, that I knew their family, I knew everything, but they are, are, are no longer uh, associated and are no longer in the church, they're no longer actively pursuing Jesus. And so uh, I made a commitment right there in 2013 um, that I was gonna do everything I could to lower that percentage. And so for me, um, I didn't have a, a strong family background. My parents divorced when I was two. Uh, my dad had a struggle with alcohol abuse. My mom struggled with drug abuse. And so I didn't have like the basic model. And so I've spent the last seven years really trying to figure out how we as parents can uh, lower that percentage. Uh, how, how can we do that? And so um, through several different things, I, I kind of shifted my role from student ministry to really working and locking arms with parents and partnering with them. Because I don't want to just say, parents, you're the primary faith trainer, and then do nothing about it. So just to say, go figure it out. I want to say, you're the primary faith trainer in the church, at, and I want to walk alongside you. And so that's a little bit about my role as adult discipleship. I, I oversee, as the kids' uh, ministry here, we have kids' pastors. Student ministry here has student pastors. Uh, as adult discipleship, I oversee all of our parents and parent ministry here. And so uh, it's a passion of mine. I really feel like God has wired me and put me on this earth to uh, equip parents to to live their God-given role as the primary faith trainer. So um, as we get into this, I wanted you to hear my background a little bit and why I'm passionate about these things. I um, also want to let you know, I oversee and run a website that's actually one year old today, empoweredhomes.org. Empoweredhomes.org is twofold. Uh, one it is about helping and giving away all of our family ministry tools to other churches. So there's a, a leadership side to Empowered Homes. And uh, part of that is just we want to give away all our children's ministry material, all of our student and all of our adults. Uh, we actually have three years of adult curriculum that's all free on the site for churches. But the other side goes back to Kara Powell's book, Sticky Faith. And what we want to do is partner with parents. And so on the, the parent side, we have over 675 resources in all different areas, uh, just trying to help your marriage, help you as parents, and then personally, as you grow as an individual. So I just want to highlight, I will help oversee all the content and do that uh, with Empowered Homes. And as one year old uh, today, it's been a joy to be a part of that. So as we get in talking about technology, I just want to kind of challenge you as parents that you are the primary faith trainer, but your role based off of uh, what age your kids are has to change. And so from birth to two years old, you're kind of the caregiver. You're just trying to keep them alive. And then you kind of turn into a cop. I'm, I'm hardcore cop right now, especially with my four-year-old. I feel like I'm always saying, stop doing that. Don't do that. Stop, stop. Okay, go ahead and do it. Okay, did that hurt? Yes, it did. You should have listened to me, right? So I feel like I'm always the cop. But I am with my oldest. I'm shifting into this coach uh, mode of, of helping him observe and helping him learn and not necessarily 
exactly showing him, but letting him figure out things. And then ultimately, as I get older, the 18 plus range, your relationship uh, is consultant. And so maybe your frustration is because you're trying to be a caregiver when you need a cop or you're trying to coach when you need to be a cop or vice versa. And so I just want to challenge you that there's different phases of parenting. It's same as there's different phases of your kids as they grow up. Um, but this evening, I want to talk about your, tech, your, your family and technology about four choices and these four choices, um, I, I believe, are key for us to really have a firm um grounded understanding of how we can leverage technology for good in our homes the first choice uh, i would challenge you to choose is choose character and so before we get into talking about screen time before we get into talking about uh setting up rules and all that stuff i want to start here because this is the most important thing how often would you say you talk about the following with your children how often do you talk about self-control, patience, being happy, fairness, being a good friend, forgiveness, work ethic, reliability, conflict resolution, serving others? Because if you don't start with your core values as a family, you're going to make comfort-based decisions when it comes to anything, especially technology. So for an example, when my kid comes home wanting a cell phone, he can beg and beg and beg and say, well, everybody has one or uh, everybody in my school does it or I need it for, for schoolwork because Canvas is the only way I can do it. We can go through that and just give into that or really anything in life unless we go back to our core values. For us as a family, we have a, a list of core values that's in our kitchen. Uh, we, we say coolies know Jesus and make him known. Coolies are kind. Uh, cool, coolies get back up because we're going to fall down, but we get back up and coolies are leaders and we got a running list and those are our core values. And so instead of making decisions based off of what the world is, is telling us, we go back to those core values. My friend, uh, he, he, his kids were struggling uh, with, with this cell phone policy. When do I get a cell phone? My kids or my friends all have it. And so what he told his son was the second that cell phone comes into our house, it's going to cause conflict. And so right now, I don't believe that you're ready based off of me as your dad. I don't think you're ready because you have proven over time that you don't do well handling conflict. And so because until you prove to me that you can handle conflict resolution, then we'll talk about actually getting a cell phone. It's a flip of uh, letting the world dictate what's going on and letting our core values dictate. So the first choice for us, I want us to start there is thinking about who your family is, like, who are you? For us, we have a hashtag, we are the coolies. And, and we say it to our kids all the time, we are the coolies. And I tell my kids every day when I walk them to school, go be a coolie today. And sometimes they give me goofy answers, like uh, coolies like to eat barbecue. Okay, that's true, but that's not a core value. And so I always try to give a core value to, to, to one of my kids every time I drop them off. So that's where we start. Now let's get into the fun. So your family and technology second choice is we got to structure space and time. I'm going to give you five tips, but before we do that uh, on empowered homes right here, we have a ton of great resources on technology. So if you go to the search bar and then you just search technology, um, it'll pull up several things. Um, and I want to just hit as you go through all of these, I just want to hit a podcast that we did on this very subject. We've done a few podcasts. Uh, we did one with Brian Hausman. Um, Brian uh, wrote the book Tech Savvy Parenting, and you can go listen to that as well. But we added some some links here uh, for as you structure space and time, as you structure what technology looks like in your family. We added some 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 great tools. This one right here is just Internet monitoring and filters. Uh, the elementary school that's across the street from us actually reached out to us and say, do you do you know what we can give to our parents as far as uh, some internet filters and stuff. So we, we opened this document, we created this document and had to give a disclaimer saying that we don't condone or, or we don't endorse any of these things, but it's a long list of uh, different types of filters and different things that you can put on there. The circle with Disney, um, we, we put through pros and cons and pricing. So here's an easy list. If you're just talking about structuring your home, 
this is an easy list for you. One of the things that we have in our home uh, is Covenant Eyes. Uh, if you have questions about Covenant Eyes, I feel like I'm an expert. I've helped a lot of families get on Covenant Eyes. It's not the best, but it works and it's pretty cost effective. So you can find all of those uh, internet monitoring on this, uh, this podcast. Another one, um, smartphone readiness. So maybe you're in the stage of do my kids, are they ready for a smartphone? Uh, the Protect Young Minds created this really great resource uh, for parents. Does my child need a, uh, a phone to stay connected? Some questions for you as a parent, for you and your spouse to really go through first and then to really bring your kids into it uh, to, to let them know and let them be a part of this. So 10 questions um, for parents, that's an easy one. Um, uh, tools for teens and parents. Uh, let me look at the chat real quick as uh, I wanna see if anybody wrote down biggest fear, meeting strangers online, behind the scenes, addicted to games. Yes, I'm with you addressing dangerous apps, all of those things. And, and a, a big one is for sure, pornography. It's an epidemic, it's a mess uh, in our world. And so we have a ton of resources. We've got general resources, articles. Um, this was put together by some of our residents and uh, they put all these together, there's some prayers, there's some books, but I wanna highlight one for every dad to at least go through and, and, and be ready to have this resource on hand. It's called the Freedom Fight. The Freedom Fight is a free resource. Um, it is a really great introduction. Um, we had a, a student recently who's got caught. Um, he actually, they're, they're, they had a cell phone charging station and the mom got up to get a drink of water in the kitchen and noticed that the cell phone was gone. So she walked upstairs and her son had had it and caught him looking at pornography. And this is the first resource that I, I sent to her. It's, 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 it's a, a starting point, a starting guide uh, to, to begin to, to find some freedom from that addiction. So uh, a lot of great resources here you could check out when it comes to all that. And, and then lastly, when you structure space and time, as you choose that, um, this one's really good. Common Sense Media, if you, if you don't know Common Sense Media, you got to get on it. I've been looking, now that my kids are getting older, I look um, on there, they do movie reviews, they do video game reviews, they do music reviews, they tell you honestly, uh, and it's not a Christian based organization, it's, it's, it's a family holistic organization and they just want to help families have uh, wholesome content. And so this is a, a family agreement, K to five uh, to, through five, six and eight, and then nine through 12th grade, um, just kind of here's some things that you make an agreement. You actually have the, the, the kids sign it and then you sign it as well. Um, and you can go through all this and, and check it out later. But these are just some key resources I want you to, to kind of know about over here. So when it comes to structure, space and time, uh, the five practical tips that we offer when it comes to technology, number one, um, wake up before your devices and make them go to bed before you do. And what I mean by this is for you as parents and kids, don't let the first thing, I know it's, don't, your kids, buy them an alarm clock. Don't let them, let that be the first thing. And don't buy into the excuse of, well, I have to have an alarm. I got to set 12 of them to wake up at seven o'clock to get to school. Like get them an alarm clock. Don't let that be the first thing that they do wake up before their devices. And then lastly, go to bed before your devices or let your devices go to bed before you do, because um, we need more time as a family. And the studies have shown the more authentic and the more genuine time we can have as a family, the higher uh, that faith transference is with our kids. If we could just share and talk and just be there. And a lot of times, and parents we're guilty too, we're all sitting with our device in our hand, with the TV on, or maybe a kid's playing video games and we're all separated, not saying a word. So this is a challenge for everybody. So parents, this is for you too, that about an hour before bedtime, let's plug in all our phones and just detach for a moment. The second tip, use mealtimes, especially dinner to reconnect and charge your family. We challenge everybody at Kingsland to have five meaningful mealtimes a week. Now, I know that sounds so daunting, especially with everything. It can be breakfast. It could be Saturday lunch. It could be uh, different times. It's not all dinner. 
And to be honest with my uh, age range right now, I have a free free range eater. My youngest, he just goes wherever he wants every time we eat. Can't sit still. So mealtime is really hard for us, but we try to leverage it as much as possible. Uh, again, use car time for conversation. Put your phones in the glove box or the center console. When you do that, you communicate that um, what, especially if you're driving, it's a big deal, but you communicate that uh, your time, our eye contact, our conversation is more important than whatever text or whatever email, or whatever uh, music or whatever I wanna listen to on my phone. Number four, have a family charging station for all devices in your room. And don't let your kids have devices in their room. I, I mentioned to you that family that um, went downstairs to get a drink of water and the mom found the phone was, was gone. This was the first thing she says was, we moved the charging station to our bedroom. So there wasn't a temptation to steal or to, to get up in the middle of the night to take those devices. Make sure it's in your bedroom, your bathroom or somewhere where if your kids were tempted to grab it in the middle of the night, they'd have to be super sneaky to get by you. Um, but it also just deters that immediately. And lastly, this is a, a freebie. Use a phone basket when friends come over. If you have teenage friends, uh, one of my buddies, he does this every time kids come over and he's got teenagers at his house all the time. He has a basket at the front door and all the kids drop their phone in the basket so that they can just hang out. They don't have to worry about being on Instagram. They don't have to worry about uh, liking or doing TikTok or whatever it is. Now the kids can go and check their phone periodically. But uh, the funny thing is that he says, he's like, every time my, my kids' friends leave, they always leave their phone. They forget about it. And because it, it they're hungry for that detached time away from their phone. So those are our five practical tips for structuring space and time. You can definitely challenge you to structure uh, all of those devices, make sure you have some internet filters, all that. You can figure that out. But I will say, I have seen kids, they're sharp, they're smart. They're gonna get around pretty much every system that you put in place. So it goes back to the first choice is choose character. What are you building into them? And we'll talk about conversations here in a second, but uh, they're, they're, they will find a way to get around it. I had a teenager who came to me and I was so proud of him for coming to me. Um, he said, man, I hadn't been looking at porn, but I got, I, I was looking at a thesaurus app, a thesaurus app on my phone. And I had misspelled the word more than three times. And after I misspelled the word, it gave me a free Google to see if I was making up the word and that free Google uh, search bar popped up and he could search whatever he wanted. He had all the internet blockers, all the filters, everything and got around it through a thesaurus app. And so not to spark fear into you, but to know that it's more important to set up conversations. It's more important to, to, to be available later when those things do happen. And we'll talk about that choice here in a second, but practical tips for structuring space and time. The third choice, and this is uh, unapologetically a dig at parents. So this is for you. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna kind of get under your skin a little bit. And if your spouse is watching right now, they may be elbowing you. But the third choice is parents. We got to set the example. We have to be present. Um, don't let your future steal your present. A lot of times, especially now with COVID, work is always at us. We get emails, we get phone calls, we get text messages. Um, we, get, we can focus so much on what's coming in the future that we, we, we lose the present right here and now. And so as parents, we've got to set up and set the example for our device use as well. Um, one challenge, I got two M's. The first M is mindfulness. Mindfulness means paying attention uh, in a particular way on purpose in the present moment. In Mark chapter five, Jesus sets this amazing example of presence. This woman who had been bleeding for 12 years had followed Jesus to this crowd and they're walking through this crowd and this woman reached out and touched Jesus and immediately she was healed. And Jesus stopped and said, who touched me? Who was it? And he asked his disciples, who touched me? And his disciples said, hey, bro, like, everybody touched you. We're in a crowd. Like, what are you talking about? He said, no, somebody touched me. And so this woman comes down and she buries her face down and says, uh, forgive me. She asked for forgiveness. And scripture says, and Mark says, she told him the whole truth. 
In that moment, Jesus gave her his eyes. Jesus gave her his ears. Jesus gave her his presence. And then the, the next part of that passage, Jesus says, daughter, you're, he you're healed. You're afflicted no more. Go in peace. And so because he was present, because he heard the whole truth, he was then able to bless her with his words and send her on her way. And for us as parents, don't miss an opportunity to bless our kids because we're stuck in our device, looking down, playing Candy Crush or checking emails or setting the bad examples. For us as parents, we have to be present when it comes to technology use. So the first one is mindfulness. Second M is modeling. If you're frustrated with your kids being on their phones or devices all the time, look at yourself. Are you on your device or phone all the time? I grew up in Arlington. Uh, here in Houston, everybody just hisses at me because I'm a big Rangers fan. Um, but you guys, I know, are, are probably all Rangers fans. My son loves the Rangers. Why? Because dad loves the Rangers. And so the, the, the way that I model my technology habits is the way that they're going to, to, to be attracted to it and be mirrors of that. And those of you in here going, I'm never on my phone. I don't ever touch my phone, but my kid's addicted. There's parts of that too. I get that. But for most of us, if we're honest, we're on our phones just as much as our kids. The last choice that we have to, to, to make is we got to be prepared. This is what I was talking about. And when your kids do see something they shouldn't see, when your kids do find something that they shouldn't find, um, we want to create a culture in our house of confession over concealment. Confession over concealment means that when they mess up, do they come to mom and dad or do they try to hide it? Do they confess what's going on? Or is your home a safe place for them to wrestle, for them to, to not have all the things figured out, for them not to, 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 to do things perfect every time? Is it safe for them to mess up or... Have you proven that every time they mess up, you just jump down their throat? You see, I would uh, challenge those, those homes that have confession, uh, that, that spend time with confession, you communicate to your kids that I have your back. If you're always on top of your kids, you communicate to your kids, I'm on top of your back. There's a difference between I have your back and I'm always on your back. And so I wanna show a video. This is a 10 second principle. Uh, this is a video you can find on Empowered Homes, but this video just explains what I just said about confession over concealment. And it really is a, an easy way for us to, to apply a rule in our homes. So watch this video. Those first 10 seconds when your kid brings something to you, confesses something to you, or says something that's heavy for you to hear, those first 10 seconds are vitally important for telling your kid whether you're safe to go to or not. If your mode is like, oh my gosh, why did you do that? Why did this happen? And you start getting in those all upset mode, your kid's going to look at that and go, okay, I'm never going there again. This isn't safe. I just disappointed mom. I just disappointed dad. They're just going to be mad at me. Who else can I go for some help in this? So I think it's very important to communicate three things when our kids bring stuff to them. They need to know, first of all, that you're proud of them. You're proud that they brought something to you, that they trusted you enough with that, because that's not always easy for them to do. The second thing is they need to know, hey, I still love you. No matter what it is, son, daughter, I still love you. And I'm so glad that you're my son and daughter. So to speak blessing in that moment is vitally important. And then finally, parents, I would say ask questions and understand the whole scope of the situation. Because we know communication is difficult. They may tell you something, and that may not be the whole story. And as parents, we need to understand the whole thing and ask questions. And then from there, we need to partner with our kid on how to help. So I think reaffirming, hey, I'm proud of you. I love you. And hey, let's talk about this. Let's ask some good questions and let's figure out the whole story and what to do next. So the 10 second principle, we tell our parents all the time that for the first 10 seconds, freak out on the inside. If your kids see something on the bus, if they come to you and immediately you just lose your mind, you're immediately communicating, oh, mom's not safe. Dad's not safe. Because it's not if, but when. The studies of all of these things are just 
scary. And as a parent myself, I'm terrified, but it's not if, but when. And so how do I prepare my heart and my mind to know that my, I want my kids on their very best day to want to come to dad, but also on their worst day, I want them to come to dad. And so for me, the 10 second principle is about checking my heart, checking my spirit, taking a deep breath, and creating a safe environment for my kids when they come to me with anything. A funny sidebar of this is I was teaching this to a dad and he's like, yeah, I've been doing the 10 second principle and my boys and they were punching each other in the face and they came up to me and they said, dad, you're gonna need 10 seconds. And just before they even got into what had happened with the fight, they were like, dad, you need 10 seconds because he had applied it so uh, diligently in his life. But for us, when it comes to technology, if we're worried about them messing up, we're worried about them getting on an app, we're worried about catching them in the middle of it. Even when you catch them uh, texting or doing something inappropriate, man, just those first 10 seconds are vital to, to create a, a place, a safe place for communication. As you choose to be prepared, the, the, the last one is to role play. Um, me and my wife role play, uh, not like that. We role play scenarios in, in our, our, our minds. Okay. Charlie gets off the bus. My oldest gets off the bus and says, Hey, my, my best friend, Nathan showed me this. Okay. How are we going to respond? We role play before it even happens. Not that we're living in fear that, Oh, we got to be doomsday preppers, but it's just being prepared to think through these scenarios of what might happen role-playing different scenarios okay let's say we give him a phone and then they break the rules they sign the phone contract and they break the rules what do we do do we just pass on it or do we hold our ground you see as parents if you have those conversations and role play beforehand you'll be prepared for when those times come and I just want to leave, uh, before we do Q&A, uh, three questions for you to ask to start building in your home this confession over concealment. And these questions, um, do not ask them all at the same time because your kids are going to think you're up to something. But these questions are for you to sprinkle in here and there throughout your weeks. The question number one is, what's the biggest struggle you're currently facing? And so asking this question, you know, to a third grader, um, a lot of times I get, oh, dad, I've got a math test that I'm worried about, or I get whatever. And so I don't get the most in-depth things. But a month ago, when we started going to school, I asked this question, and I've been asking it for years, and I asked this question, hey, buddy, what's the biggest struggle you're currently facing? And he was honest and said, Dad, you know, I'm kind of kind of worried about this coronavirus stuff. And so we got to have a great conversation. We had the, this great conversation of uh, of all the, the pandemic and all this stuff. And then ultimately we got to talk about, hey, buddy, who do we trust? Who do we trust? In the middle of all this, who do we trust? And so you may not get in-depth conversations right away, but if you ask it over and over, you are communicating that you care about their struggles. Second question, this one may be a little cheesy, but how can I pray for you today? I asked, uh, again, I asked this question to my kids and, and a first and third grader and a four-year-old, you're not getting in-depth stuff. Uh, but I was walking my son uh, to school the other day and I asked him, hey buddy, what can I pray for you uh, for today? And, and we're talking and he's like, hey, pray that I get picked on this team for recess. And I'm like, okay, some Avengers DC thing, recess, whatever. I didn't really care. I was like, okay, I'll pray for that. And then as we get to the crosswalk, he puts his hand on my arm and says, hey, dad, what can I pray for you today? And so we created this, this dialogue. And as I'm walking across the crosswalk, the crosswalk lady's looking at me with her little stop sign. It's like, why are you crying, dude? And I'm like, my son wants to pray for me. But it created this conversation and this ongoing dialogue with him to know that I am on his team. I've got his back and I am praying for him. And lastly, this is incredibly insightful to ask your kids, hey, how do you know I love you? I, I talked to too many peers that have told me over and over and over. It's like, you know, I can count on my hand how many times my dad told me that he loved me. And, and 
as heartbreaking as that is, I know parents today that oversaturate their kids. Hey, buddy, I love you. I love you. I love you. They tell them over and over because they didn't get it. But this question's different. This question is much different. How do you know I love you? It's going to give you some insight to, to what they value, what they see in you. Because you may be thinking, oh, I'm supporting you. I'm encouraging you. I'm doing all these things. And your, your kids just drop a shell on you and say, I know you love me because you work long hours. Oh, I don't want that them to know that's the only way that they experience love. I know you love me because when I hit home runs that you're really happy. Oh, no, no, no. I don't want that kind of affirmation. I, I want you to know that I love you just because you're mine, right? And so these three questions, also, if you're married, these are great questions for uh, you to ask your spouse. Again, not at the same time, because they're going to know you're up to something. So what's your biggest struggle you're currently facing to create the conversation? How can I pray for you today? And then how do you know I love you? And those are just simple ways. And so the, the four things uh, as we go through, uh, number one, we've got to choose character. What are the core values in your family? What are the core values for you and who you are and, and how do you get away from making comfort based decisions based off of the, the, the current culture? Um, number two is you've got to structure space and time. You can't be ignorant, but at the same time, you've got to be ready that, that they're smart and they can trip anything. Uh, my buddy who has the, uh, the app on his son's truck uh, that, that monitors where they go at all times. He sent his son for the first time to go overnight with some friends and says, hey, don't go anywhere. And his son was like, dad, you can monitor where I'm going. Why would I go anywhere? And he immediately said, I know you can disable that. Like, just don't go anywhere, right? So we have to structure space and time, but know uh, that it goes back to that character first. And then the third choice is to be present for us as parents and with our spouse. How many times do we sit in bed? I know I'm guilty of it. I sit in bed before we, we go to sleep or I sit in bed in the morning and I'm checking the news. I'm reading all the politics junk and my wife's on her phone doing different stuff. We're not, we hadn't talked to each other in 30 minutes, right? We have to set the example of being present. And then lastly, we got to be prepared. Don't let this be something that blindsides you when it comes to technology. Be ready, be prepared, and be open for these conversations. So that's my challenge for us when it comes to technology. It's not all the tips and tricks and hacks for technology. I'm not an expert, but I am a, I feel like God has given me a, a heart to go after the heart of parents. And what, what I would challenge you when it comes to technology is to really wrestle with, it's not the technology that's the issue. Uh, it's just a tool that we have in our house that we have to, 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 to put inside the structure that's already there. Uh, the technology doesn't run the house. Uh, our structure and, and stability of who we are as a family is stronger than any piece of technology, any video game, any phone, any device that we have. And so we make sure our structure is, is secure. We can handle whatever's thrown at us. And so that's my challenge for us, Jimmy. Yeah. Any questions? Uh, yeah, we have um, a question here. It just said, generally speaking, um, what is what is some advice that you give or you counsel that you give to parents when they're saying, you know, when is it time to give a phone? And I know you showed that resource and that may be something you want to pull back up. But um, besides, I, I mean, I know the typical answer is, well, you know, when you know the kid, so it's 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 up to the kid. But just some general guidelines that you would share with parents to say, hey, you know, here here's here's some things to think about, you know, maybe age ranges. Cause like you said, I know you're, you said third graders having cell phones already, and, you know, and that's not, that is not, unfortunately that's not uncommon, but what, what are some just general guidelines you would give to parents who are saying, when, when's a good time to maybe start considering giving my, my child a cell phone? Yeah. And I, I know the, we, we want to, you want to hear an answer. It's like, all right, when they're 12, that's when. Yeah. You want to know that definitive answer, but the reality is you do know your kid. It depends on your kid, but um, there's a lot of factors that go into it, especially with school now. Um, if, if you're in junior high and you don't have a device and they're trying to do things on devices with books and e-readers and all of that, um, you can always say, just use the class iPad. Well, the kid in the class before didn't charge it, so it's dead. And so it's an automatic disadvantage for your kid. And so there's a lot of elements that you have to go through um to to understand you know what's the why uh, is it school-based is it all of those things but really 
Um, when you do decide to give them that phone, I think the biggest thing is to really set up those rules and regulations. Uh, you know, the, the, is my child ready for a smartphone? Um, this is a great tool for us um, as you go through and it's just easy, you know, asking the question, does your child already respect rules? Do they already respect the things that you have established in your house? If they don't, or if they have a proven track record that they don't, they're not ready for a cell phone. I don't care if they're 18, you know? Um, have you talked about your child about the dangers of pornography? Are they ready for those conversations? And, you know, uh, my son right now at 13, I want him to hear about pornography. I want him to hear about sex and all of these things from me. That's a safe place. That's not awkward. Um, but I also want to be sensitive to not introduce something to him that that's too soon or too early. Uh, you shall know what types of information is safe to share online. You, again, with the new phones and stuff, you can block a lot of these deals. Uh, filtering accountability system. Um, number nine, this is one. What are your list of rules? Um, so before you, I would say, you know, for that parent, yes, it's all about your kid. Uh, it's all about what, what they're going through and, and what they're ready for. But before you do that, really know that when you introduce that device, that especially cell phone, you're introducing conflict immediately into your home. Are you ready? Can your kids handle it? Uh, can you handle it? And I would also say um, that's your cell phone. It's not your kid's cell phone. They're just borrowing it. So whatever you give them, um, do not let them play the game of, well, it's mine. It's my privacy. No, you have every right as a parent to look through that thing. To, to know that it's being monitored, that you're going to read the text messages you, and you're going to go through all of those things. It's not their cell phone. They, there's no such thing as privacy in your house. Right. right. Uh, so I don't know if that answers it, but uh, I, w I would say, you know, if you could sit down and make a list and if you can honestly say, okay, you know, my fifth, sixth grader, and maybe they are ready, they can handle this, uh, then, then by all means. But the hard part is we, we can't give you a definitive. Yeah. You know, age because that's what every parent wants right just tell me age and right uh, it's, it's not that hard but i would say roughly around middle school right now just the way school is the way that everything else is and honestly there's times where my third grader he's playing with his friends riding his bike around i wish i could text him and be like dude come home mm -hmm. you know there's times for that too but um mm -hmm. and communicating with them but i hope that and and to your point, Bobby, I mean, you know, with cell phones, there's you can step up kids. Just, you don't have to buy them the iPhone that has access to everything. I mean, one of the first phones that we gave our kids, you were able to call and text and that's all you were able to do. Yeah. And um, and to piggyback off your answer for us, it was when we had to uh, when we knew our kids were going to be staying after school or doing practices and stuff like that. And we knew they needed to call us to get a ride or whatever. So that kind of determined when we said, you know, it's time for a cell phone for them. But um, uh, next question that came in, what are some um, guardrails that can help a child use tech without being controlled or obsessed by tech? So I guess, um, what, what are some guardrails as a parent that you can put in um, yeah. to help them to not just get so locked into it that that's all they're doing? Yeah, screen time, um, setting up those screen time uh, restrictions, letting them know, being realistic. Uh, also, it's hard for parents because uh, my four-year-old, if we're out somewhere and I can give him veggie tales on my phone, he'll be quiet for a little bit. I got to work on making sure I don't default to just throwing a device in him because he'll settle down for a little bit. Um, uh, so setting up those screen times is, and also um, setting up some rules for us, our kids, um, we don't let them watch TV during um, the school, uh, during school week. Uh, so Monday through Friday, Friday, they're not allowed to watch TV first thing in the morning. You know, on the weekend, Saturday morning cartoon, they can turn it on. But we just found that, man, they are sluggish. They just want to watch that one episode before school and don't really get much time with us. And they don't get ready for school. Um, and so we just made a rule in our house that TV before school is, is not allowed. And really, not till after school. Um, we don't we don't really let them watch a lot of TV until we get all the stuff. We try to play at the park and do all that. Uh, when it comes to the switch, my son is all about the switch right now. Playing in the pandemic, uh, I let him get Fortnite. You can hiss at me as parents, but he likes to build stuff. He's not killing people on it. 
but he gets to talk to his buddies. And that was one of the wins for, for him. He didn't get to see his friends for months. And so his buddies are all building these elaborate worlds and doing all this stuff and they're talking. And so, uh, but there was a point in there where all he would talk about, he's like, dad, I gotta get the skin. I want to do this uh, emote, this dance on Fortnite, blah, blah, blah. And finally I was like, Hey, we're taking a break, bro. Like we're, you got a week off from the switch. And he pushed back on it, but he understood like it is just a video game and it has consumed your whole world and you can't function without talking about it. So we just took a rest from it for a week and uh, and then slowly set up those parameters with it again. Uh, but it's so hard. Um, but here's the other flip side. He, he, the, I think the comment was obsessed by tech. They're, uh, they're technology natives. Like they, this is their world. This mm. is they're used to this is what they know they're going to be so more so much more advanced than we'll ever be and so I don't want to hinder that as well like I want them to have the skills and to do all those things uh, I don't I don't necessarily want to hinder hinder their uh, development I don't want them to get to high school and they've never used Google you know like stuff like that like I want them to to be able to be in that world but for it to not be obsessed is it's a key balance. It's a balancing act for sure. But there's times yeah. where it's like, cut it off, bro. You're done. So yeah, yeah. I just uh, put a, a link, parents in the chat to uh, he mentioned parental controls, and that that's a link that'll take you to how to do that with all, with a whole bunch of different devices. I, I think parents, a lot of parents don't realize that you, there's a lot that you can do yes. as far as setting up how when the internet comes on, when the internet comes off, all that kind of jazz. So it kind of helps, helps with that for sure. Yeah. Any modem or router you can customize and get in and turn it on and off and do all that stuff. Yeah. Um, it's, it's super, I mean, it's, I say it's easy, but uh, it does take some learning uh, to get yeah. in. But yeah. And um, Chris Jones, who's behind the scenes, he knows how to do all that. So feel free to ask Chris. <laughs> um, so another question, suggested response when you find something not so great on your child's device. Um, don't ignore it. Um, that's one thing. Um, don't respond immediately. That's the 10 second principle. Um, I had a parent who, uh, the dad, he called me, um, his son, we're adults here. His son had sent a picture of himself, his area, uh, to another girl. And so, he called me and he's like, I'm about to choke this kid. Uh, like what I'm, I'm so hot and furious that he would do such a thing. And the girl was a family friend that they go to our church and it was just this crazy mess. And so, um, I, obviously you can't ignore something like that. You have to talk about it. You have to do it. But, um, if you know yourself and know that you're going to fly off the handle, you got to step away from the situation. You got to think greater big picture of what's going to happen uh, through this conversation. And you've got to kind of work through those scenarios of, of, of what may happen. You may go to your kid and they may confess and cry and do all those deals, but I also know teenagers that will just shrug, shrug their shoulders and be like, what? I don't care. You know, how do you respond with that? You, you, you've got to just kind of mentally prepare for any scenario but ultimately, when you do uh, find something that is not so great, you have to communicate. And this is vital because, oh, man, so many teenagers that I've worked with is like, I met my parents, well, little kids will tell me I messed up with my parents and they they don't love me anymore. Mm. So you, we've got to over communicate. Hey, you messed up. But does that change what I think about you? Does that change how much I love you? There's nothing you can do for me to love you less there's nothing for you to do for me to love you more in the same way Jesus does. And so uh, overly communicating your grace and your love and that we're going to work through this is vital for, for you keeping um, that, that, that strength in your relationship, because a lot of wounds that happen and Jimmy, I know, you know, counseling and, and there's different stuff, but a lot of wounds that happen, happen in those moments when the kid messes up and mom and dad didn't respond uh, in a correct way. And it created a wound that, that will last forever if it's not done or dealt with or, or, or work through later in life. And so, uh, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that too, Jimmy. No, I, I think you're exactly right. Your, your initial response. And I love that 10 second video because that's, that's so, because that again, it communicates what they said in the video, it communicates what's safe to share and what's, what's safe not to share. Matter of fact, I had a conversation just this week 
and a, uh, a student responded to their parent and basically just said, I, I can't, uh, it's so hard to disagree with you, mm. which in other words, you know, it's like anytime I say what I'm thinking, you're automatically responding back and, and have a counter argument, which right or wrong, basically what, what's communicated there to the, to that student was, you know, you're not listening. You're just kind of, you're kind of, your inner lawyers jumped in and is already responding back to me. And so, yeah, yeah most definitely how you respond and, and how you listen and empathize with your student. Yeah. Um, another question here real quick. It says, uh, we have a Chromebook from school that has access to the internet that we normally wouldn't allow. What can we do to ensure that she has healthy boundaries at school? At healthy boundaries at school. That's, I mean, it goes back to some trust elements. Um, the school systems are pretty good at locking down stuff. Um, so when they're on campus or on the Wi-Fi, the schools do a pretty good job. Again, they can work around all of those things, but it's just over communicating. You know, I trust you, right? Um, and, and, and letting them know that that trust is there until it's not. And when that trust is not, uh, then they have to face the consequences of what that might look like. And what that might look like is them having to, to get off the digital platform for a little bit. Uh, schools will work around uh, parents that say, hey, th I'm sorry, but they're not using the Chromebook and here's why. Uh, schools will make alternatives. I've seen it uh, done. It's not easy. It's, it can be somewhat embarrassing, but uh, it's just communicate. I trust you until I don't trust you. And um, allowing for, for those times when they break that trust of, Hey, this is what it means. Uh, you're going to be trying to have to figure out how to do homework um, differently. Uh, the other side too is if they are home, is setting up some ground rules that public areas don't let them take it to their room. Never let your kids take devices to their room. Just create some public spaces uh, for that. Even my kids who have these little iPads and they play silly games, it's all downstairs. They don't get to take any of that upstairs. Um, they they have a TV that's upstairs. It doesn't have a control or a remote. The only way I can turn it on is through my phone and I dictate what gets played upstairs for them in the game room. And so um, it's just a, it goes back to trust, but also setting up again, the structuring the space within your home. Um, but I realized they could go to Starbucks and not be on that, that Wi-Fi um, and could potentially go down a road. It's just having the conversation before. Have you talked to them about Hey, if you're not on secure network, are you tempted to even look at stuff? You know, have you looked at stuff? And again, whatever that response is, being being a safe place for for that conversation. I, I, that's what I would say. Yeah. Another parent asked. Uh, well, actually, they responded to that question, which was change your DNS address. What okay. does that mean, Bobby? <laughs> DNS address. I don't know. Maybe Chris knows. Oh, maybe Chris knows. I don't either. I think. Yeah. I don't know what that means. Anyway, so someone responded to that to that one question. Um, so let me ask you this quickly, and because I know we're running out of time, what are some common mistakes that you see parents making when it comes to technology? And I know you sort of addressed some of this already with uh, defaulting to what's easy, defaulting to what, but what are some other things that you would say, man, if parents could get this, not that it would it make everything better, but it would just make a life a little bit easier when you're kind of dealing with this issue technology in your home? Um, yeah, so I would say dealing with technology, one of the biggest things with technology that comes is social media. And so uh, one of the biggest mistakes is, oh yeah, let my daughter have an Instagram, I don't care, it's fine. Um, and then they have these Finstagrams, which are fake Instagrams. And once you get on there, they're posting all kinds of stuff. There's no structures. There's nothing. Parents just feel like it's, it's harmless. They only have to be 13. It's not a big deal. Well, if you spend any time on Instagram, you could find just as much trash as anywhere else, uh, any other app, same with Facebook. And most kids today don't really care about Facebook as much. Um, TikTok is a huge one. Um, so I would say social media, the social media stuff, I see parents make mistakes of not talking through that. And also, um, when you do allow them to have social media, make sure you have their password, make sure you can access all of their stuff. Again, it goes back to balancing that trust relationship with them. Um, there's a really great book and, uh, see how fast Chris is, uh, the teen's guide to social media. Maybe he can put this down in the chat. It's by Jonathan McKee, uh, teen's guide to social media and mobile devices, 21 tips 
to wise posting in an insecure world. Um, the other side to social media that I, I see um, parents make the mistakes are um, they themselves are posting about their kids um, either in embarrassing ways um, that uh, their kids are just shaking their heads going, I cannot believe my parents would post this about me or they post so much about their kids that uh, their kids are hanging on every like that their parents get and their identity is based off of how many likes that are they're getting from their parents' friends. And then the parents' identity is how many likes I can get about my kids who are doing such great things. Social media, again, is a great tool, but it can be used for some pretty damaging things when it comes to identity. And so um, that's one big thing uh, when it comes to uh, mistakes. Some other mistakes uh, is just not looking at your, every iOS, iOS device, so that's Apple, uh, has built in um, things for parents to, to monitor screen time, to, to set restrictions. Um, parents just hand them a thousand dollar device, a computer that can give them access to the whole world and they don't even put any parameters around it. So I see that happen all the time. Uh, and then, you know, kids just abuse it and take advantage of it. And so uh, it's, it's a, uh, man, that's, that's one that know your kid's device before you get it. And I know you mentioned, give them a dumb phone. Don't give them a smartphone. Give them a, give them a dumb phone until they can handle a smartphone. Right. But the kids want the latest Apple product. I get because their friends are having it. And so that right. goes with the character. Don't, don't default to comfort-based decisions. What is what is right for your family? So, right. Um, someone asked, uh, um, "What are some of the ages that you would recommend um, allowing oh, wow. Instagram or allowing Twitter, so, some of the social media apps?" I Again, say, I know you, you can't give a specific age, but just kind of guidelines. I would say let the current rules dictate some of those, and most of those are thirteen, and those are getting. Uh, I want to say Instagram may be getting up to 15. Um, so if your kid's younger than that, just say, look, you can't have it. Um, but then it goes back to, again, um, can you trust your kids? Um, I had a buddy who uh, he's on, actually on staff and uh, he made a rule with his son that, hey, when you're 16, there's no wrong or right reason. But when you're 16, you can have Instagram. And he on his 16th birthday, uh, set up an Instagram account with them and did all this stuff. There was, and he, he told him, he's like, it's not based off of anything. I just said 16. And so you can't do it until then. Um, and, and, you know, whatever that might look like, it's 14 or 15, whatever that might look like for you and your family, Facebook, I think the parameter is still 13 Twitter. I'm not real sure. TikTok is, I want to say it's 13, but man, I hope that they put it as, uh, 18, that, that, that's a messy place. Um, mm -hmm. as my wife sends me stuff all the time, uh, most of hers is cooking recipes, but then I click on it. And then the next one is some girl dancing. I'm like, <laughs> Good grief. So yeah. Yeah. yeah those up. That's, that's uh, true. Yeah. All right. Well, man, I appreciate your time and thank you so much for um, sharing with us a lot of great research. Any other books that you have there that you wanted yeah. to throw up? Yes, let's uh, let's see how good Chris is. Um, so I have two books for guy, one for guys, one for girls. Um, this is Sissy Goff. This is called Raising Worry Free Girls. Uh, I read this and it's for uh, it's just amazing. Our girls are stressed when it comes to social media. They're anxious like never before. There's so much stuff going on in their life. Um, and and how do we raise worry free girls that rest on who they are. The other one is uh, Jonathan McKee, another one of his, uh, a guy's guide to four battles every young man must face. And one of those battles is technology and pornography. And so this is uh, actually a book for your kid, for your student. Uh, so if you have a teenager, this is actually a book for them to go through. And there's questions for them to say, hey, go to your parents and ask them blank. Um, and the last one, because we talked about pornography, and that's such a big one, uh, Rethinking Sexuality. Uh, this is uh, Julie Slattery. Um, this is a, uh, talks about the industry. It talks about all the mental issues when it comes to pornography and different things to tackle uh, so that you can look for signs in your kids that maybe there's some 
uh, unhealthy sexuality and also just talks about purity in general. So uh, this is a really good one. And then uh, lastly, uh, a new book. I talked about the Sticky Faith book. This is a follow up to the Sticky Faith book and the research. It's called Growing With. Um, you know, as we want to disciple our kids, the studies have shown that if we are growing in our faith together and we trust that God is committed to trans tr transforming all of us in our family together, uh, we see some incredible things and gre incredible gospel centered things uh, in our family. So it's a, it's a change of perspective for parenting. It's not about the kid. It's about your heart as a parent. And so uh, those are a few that I have. I got plenty others, but my email, um, Jimmy, you free to send it out. Uh, empoweredhomes.org has a ton of resources. Uh, and I, if I can help in any way, uh, like I said, I'm not an expert, but I just care deeply about parents um, because it's a, it's a, a challenging task, but it's a task that, that God wants for us and he is for us. And uh, yeah, so. Great, great. Well, I appreciate it. And parents, I echo that, you know, you can contact Bobby and contact me, contact Chris. And if we don't have the resource on hand, we can definitely help you find it. And I wanted to tell you that our next webinar is going to be on November 1st at five o'clock. And this one's going to be uh, with called uh, connecting with your teenager, basically how to talk so that they'll listen and how you can listen. So they'll talk with you, but that's going to be happening on November 1st uh, on, at five o'clock. And then on November 15th, we're actually doing a parent webinar on pornography and um, your students and, and kind of walking through that. And so we got a, a, a good taste of that today and looking forward to those. Bobby, again, I appreciate your time. Thanks, and uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining us, all right? All right. All right, parents, thank you. We'll see you next time. See you, Bobby. See you guys.